Hello, good morning, Ajay, by example. Very good. Uh, so just a qua quick repeat of the thing Piotr shared in the other room. Winter is coming, as you know, and we have friends there in Ukraine, so there is a box also. If you want to donate, that would be awesome to share some warmth with our friends. My name is Eva Koprowska. I will be your host for the next two lectures. My big pleasure. And our first, first presenter is Stephanie Wont from Bupa. She's a strategist. <laughs> and I can say that I envy you, Stephanie, one thing in your <laughs> life. She shared that she had a branch with Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, am I right? Oh, not with them, in the same restaurant as them. Oh, Slightly different. Not eating. Not eating together. Just looking. Just yeah. looking, yeah. Still. <laughs> but we are not about this today. We are about <laughs> the hackathon thing. And before we will start, I would need to clarify something. It would be a little different presentation than usual, due to the fact that we both took part in this hackathon. So when I asked Stephanie to present the insights and experiences with this event, she said, I prefer to have a conversation than the lecture. And you know, everything is possible at the by example. So if Stephanie wants to have a conversation, let's have it. But not only with me, also with you. So you know the tool, this is Slido, you have hashtag ABE2020. And then please choose the yellow room, because this is the room when we are at the moment. This is the yellow room. And you can ask the questions. And we will try and follow the question just after the first part of the presentation. Is that OK? Awesome. So let's play some music for a start. Yeah, we'll start with a short video, which hopefully will come back up on screen. So that was the internal comms we have connected with the hackathon thing, which we did twice. And we wondered, before, before we start the presentation, how many of you ever took part in any hackathon? Could you please raise your hand? Half a group. You can see that. Super. And Anna. <laughs> and how many of you took part in the remote hackathon when there is no real life connection? Virtual. Yeah. Like so. Yeah, it was like during that pandemic, right? Yeah. So you did. Raise your hand if you did, please. Let Just me see. One. one. One person. Okay. So we have a rare topic. And the last question, I promise. How about the healthcare? Have you ever tried the hackathon innovation in a healthcare business? Yes. Brilliant. We have people with experience. That's very good because maybe we can have a conversation with you about your experience experience as well. So, be disruptive. This is on your t-shirt, on my t-shirt, <laughs> and on the presentation. What does it mean? So, um, be disruptive is the, is the name we gave to our global virtual hackathon. Um, it is about disrupting the future of healthcare. Healthcare as an industry is changing at pace. Um, we need to digitally transform ourselves as our customers expect a different experience in line with what they may see in banking or in media. And um, we know that it's not just the tech team at Bupa um, that needs to be involved in that digital transformation, it is everybody. So our event was about anybody across our whole organization taking part and coming up with ideas to transform our business and to transform the healthcare industry. So we can see some numbers here. Could you please very quickly describe how big was that? 
So um, Boop has a global presence, uh, and as I said, everybody was invited to take part. We had people sign up from 16 countries, um, from east to west, Poland. very much spanning the whole globe. Um, we had 700 people plus take part. That includes those who took part as hackers or disruptors, as we call them. That includes our coaches and our judges. Um, and we had people who are literally working in care homes on the front line with our customers take part, as well as people from our corporate functions, let's say marketing, technology. We had our, some doctors taking part. So it is a real diverse mix of people. Um, that we put into about 95 teams, I think I've rounded these numbers slightly, that basically worked in time zones. So if we take Asia-Pacific, uh, Asia for example, our teams were created of people mixed from New Zealand, Australia, and Hong Kong. Um, in Europe and the Middle East, we had Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Poland, Spain, the UK. I'm worried I've missed some. Chile. Chile. Uh, yeah, so South America were, yep. uh, were again mixed in teams um, so that they could work within a similar time zone but really get access to people they wouldn't meet on a day-to-day -day basis in their normal business unit or team. And actually the feedback, the number one piece of feedback we got was that people enjoyed that part the most, meeting and working with um, people from the uh, cross-section of countries in parts of the business. Yeah, because the following the sun uh, hypothesis was that it is the part when we want to be connected. Like I was working with the uh, surgeon from Saudi Arabia and I've met him and his idea about innovation in medical uh, business, which was absolutely awesome because he was the first hand in this business and he had the understanding of the problems that we have at the moment and the future that we will have in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and also in the next part, we connected in the built teams, right? So those teams were collocated or remotely collocated in one market unit. Yes. Um, yeah, I should explain, actually. Our event had two phases. Because you may wonder, how can people from across the business, be them in, in care homes or doctors, take part in a hackathon? And actually, the way we made that possible is to have two phases. The first phase was about coming up with ideas. You didn't have to actually build anything. You had to create a video or a pitch of your idea. So we spent two days in teams doing that. Uh, then there was some judging, some live pitches and some judging um, by a variety of senior leaders. And the winners from that first ideas stage, those ideas went through um, to the second stage, which was another two days, so it was all within the space of one week, where we had build teams ready to go across um, our different markets, across the globe again, to turn those ideas into prototypes, rapid prototyping, to show that we can very quickly take a disruptive idea and test out you know, a part of it. And that was very powerful, because we had the people from this business doing this job, medical, surgeons, nurses, take cares. I don't know how to say the people that are working in Bupa take care. Care home assistants. Thank yep. you. And we have tech people. We have people that do not know this business is so good. And we had this cooperation of innovation and how to put it into proof of concept that we can do that in the future. So if we can ask you, um, to think for a moment about the best future in healthcare. Maybe we can use your ideas as well in the next hackathon. Could you please think what will be this good thing that we can prototype next time in Poland regarding healthcare or around the globe? Any ideas? You put them on the spot, Eva. <laughs> Come up with I an will. idea instantly. You know me. <laughs> There's one. That, yes, yeah. please. Spending as much time as possible with the family, not having to go to the hospitals, but being able to take care of most things from home and being close to the loved ones. 
So this is a very interesting topic, and I think we had the one prototype in Hackathon that was addressing this. So, you know, it was this beautiful future when we connect the medic from around the world with the person who needs that, of course, starting remotely, but maybe in the future in augmented reality, even better. I've um, popped up on the screen for you some of the big themes that came out from across our teams. It was really interesting to see of the nearly 100 teams, actually we found there was probably about 40 unique ideas. You might think that's a bad thing, but actually it shows that we are all sort of pulling in the same direction. And it helped to validate some of our strategy work that we already have underway in the company. Um, liquid or home hospital, to your idea, helps to um, empower you as the patient to have more access to to data about your health um, so that you can personally manage your health, stay at home, have less visits to the doctor. Um, in terms of um, virtual reality, automated medical advice, there's, there's heaps we can do in the AI space to help predict and prevent illness. So at the moment, we very much wait for our patients to call us and tell us they're ill. And at that point, we will help them. But using technology, using data and AI as a great example, we can move that whole care pathway forwards to help you prevent illness and also using various um, data that's, that's quite new and revolutionary, genomic data, for example, um, we can help prevent illness that may lie ahead. I took my phone to encourage you to ask the questions if you need. You can just speak up at the moment or you can use the Slido hashtag about 2020 yellow room. So while waiting for your questions, I'm looking at this picture and we covered a lot of what behind the hackathon. So we have a lot of ideas, we have two phases, we have many people around the world. But what about the why behind? Why we started to do Hackathon, the previous one, the last one, and we intend to do the next one at Pupa? So there are, there are multiple benefits to doing a Hackathon. It's not all about the ideas that you get out at the end of it. That is one you know, source of value um, to your company in doing a hackathon, but actually a lot of it is around the learning experience. Building a culture um, of agility and innovation by bringing in people from across the business to experience this very rapid, very intense way of working where they can see in vivid technicolor, all oh right, so we can actually achieve a lot in two days. Whereas when I go back to my team, we have an hour meeting a week for six months, and we achieve the same, if not less. So it's a way of getting a wide group of people in your company to experience that in a powerful way that they can then take back to their teams um, and help build and spread that culture uh, of agility and innovation. It, we found, and if I flip backwards. We also found that our people found it really energizing. So in terms of your employee proposition, to invest the time to give your people two days or more or less to take part in an experience like this, they really valued. There was huge amounts of energy across the globe, lots of positive feedback. So you can really um, help motivate, sorry, motivate and energize your staff as well. They were. They were, and I, I can found very encouraging the process when we can connect people with so different backgrounds. That was the main point, because I've realized during these two editions of Hackathon so many how many times I was wrong. I was wrong about projecting, designing experience, not only about, not, not only experience of m our customer, but also our medical people, mm. what they do on daily basis, how they do, and how it will be better for them and for our customer together. And we have the first question, first three. Okay. So maybe we can um, 
ask this one, which is very interesting. 90 plus teams sounds a bit for judges. So could you please elaborate, Stephanie, a little about this mechanism of judging those 90 initiatives we had? Yeah, absolutely. So up front, we set some judging criteria, which was quite simple. There were three criteria um, that our teams had to meet. And at the end of the two days, they produced a pitch, which could be basically a, a two-minute video, though in Australia they did decide they were going to let every single team pitch live, which was great. Our judges then basically had uh, an online tool with the three criteria, the team numbers, and they scored them as each pitch went. We then managed to add up the scores and the top teams, um, I suppose, went through to the next round. We were really lucky in that our group CEO was very engaged. He's sort of the overall exec sponsor for this event. And in the end, he took the top three teams from each of our time zone groups and chose the overall winner himself. Uh, so we had three winners, one from each time zone group, and then the group CEO chose the overall um, winner. And when you mentioned the, uh, the criteria for the hackathon, this is the quite important insight, and we've learned it after the first edition, that when people weren't aware what will be the judging criteria, like we didn't discuss it, we didn't provide an examples, it was a little chaotic, a little too more, too chaotic. <laughs> so in the next time, we put some efforts, uh, coaches, uh, facilitators, team of organizers, to go through the acceptance criteria. Even our executives, I think they recorded a short video clarifying what is the why behind and what criteria will be important for us. So that was the vital point. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just um, continue on the point of coaches. Eva was one of our um, fantastic coaches who was there to support our teams. I think that was a critical part of the event. A lot of these people have never taken part in anything similar. They've never had to lean into the strategy. They have never had to um, create ideas. So they did need some support to enjoy the experience. So we had a, a, an amazing crew of coaches across the globe who were there to jump in on the team meetings to help steer, provide advice, um, which Eva did an amazing job of. And even if we were not all the AJ coaches, we have people who are the great has the great experience with design. We have people from data. We have people uh, who are mm, providing the uh, product centric approach for the people. So we were a group, and we used the pool approach. So if any team needs our support, they were supporting. They, they were um, telling on the chat channel that they need a coach speaking in certain language, so it could be Spanish, English, Polish sometimes, yeah. and they are here. So we jumped in, we are having the conversation, if they want to continue, we are available after an hour of the second day. And that was quite a journey, and I would say if you would like to improve as a coach, in delivering what is needed right now for them. That's great experience, and I do recommend to be a part of it. And we have another great question about uh, why so uh, great initiative like Hackathon is only once a year. And I would like to connect it with eco-disruptive initiative, if you don't mind, Stephanie. Of course. So my personal hope is that we will have one global company-wide hackathon a year. But in doing that, we will spark teams across the organization to run their own. We have seen two, one in Brazil and one in the UK, uh, spin up. Because as a way of working, it doesn't have to be global, annual. It can be small and specific as well. Um, and it's a bit like lighting fires all over the organization to, to bring that energy. Um, doing one global annual one, I think, gives it the visibility that it might not otherwise get, and that exec sponsorship. Um, in Booper, we actually do run another program, which is called Eco Disruptive. You can see the theme. Uh, we are 
very much pushing our people to understand that the healthcare industry is being disrupted and we need to transform. Eco-disruptive is slightly different. It is a um, program focused on sustainability where people can work with startups um, from across the world. Teams choose a startup that they believe in and then they help produce a pitch that then goes through a similar process of judging to win some actual real funding to help that startup then um, launch and progress with their idea. The power of having both EcoD and Be Disruptive um, is that people can lean in in different ways that suit them, uh, or they can lean into them all, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we have another interesting question about the people from around the globe and how we address that. So we can share that we uh, had uh, this follow the sun approach, which is like the people were starting with a certain part of the globe, with certain group of the coaches, and with Stephanie who never sleeps <laughs> all the time available for them. And then when those group of people delivered the outcome, we moved to the another part of the globe and another part of the people and it was following the sun for two days, which was exhausting and was energizing. But uh, I think that was the good outcome. Yeah, I think there was energy that came through Australia knowing they were handing over to Europe and the Middle East and there was some nice communication that went on at those sort of yeah. handover parts of the day. Um, the languages was tricky. Yes. So our South American um, business, the majority do not speak English. They only speak Spanish. So we had to be flexible and we had to allow them to pitch in Spanish, uh, which meant we had to source judges who spoke English and Spanish. Um, but the extra effort was definitely worth it in terms of making those people feel included and are able to take part in a way that they were comfortable to. Um, I think one of our three finalists, actually, the video was in Spanish. Yeah. Um, and just before it went sort of broadcast to the whole organization, we had to very quickly get someone to sit at the desk and help translate it. Um, but I think that's important. It is. And talking about finalists, we have a question. I'm not sure, can I share that, but I asked the specialist. OK Bupa, the winning project, can you tell a little more about that? So OK Bupa was the Latin America winner. Yeah. Um, it's fundamentally a little bit around um, the liquid home hospital uh, and how I think the team suggested that there are various wearables you can have in your home. For example, there are mirrors. It, it's not a great example, but there are mirrors that you can have where you could stand in front of the mirror and say, OK, Booper, show me my, my stats for the day. And it would tell you your blood pressure, your weight, how much sleep you had, your stress levels. Um, so it's about kind of AI in the home, yeah. that particular idea. And I think the fun part, if I can share that, is was when Gryffindor team, he was, they were coding Siri based on this idea, and we had this live uh, presentation, and the judges weren't sure, like, you know, in this uh, big competition when judges ask singer to sing a cappella because it's unbelievable, so the judges ask, okay, so take your Siri and do it live right now with a comment that you programmed and they did. And we were like waiting and there was luck. And yes, a Siri answered with simple, of course, simple comment, but that was the proof of concept that we can do that. And that was a powerful moment for our senior leaders to see that we had folks who could bring to life these ideas in just two days. Because they might have looked at these ideas and thought, well, yes, okay, in three years, in five years, we'll get to that. But what we were showing them is actually, no, let's experiment now. And we will then, you know, um, learn from those experiments and be well ahead of where we could be. I have this awesome question from Jarek. I will read it if you want to add some, something, Jarek, just help me. We often do not participate in the hackathon 
as we don't feel that we can provide a value for the team. What could you say to such person to overcome these faults? And you first. <laughs> um, I feel that it's when I, um, I basically got told, I think maybe five, six years ago, that I was going to go to Microsoft in Seattle and take part in a hackathon. And my reaction was, we've well, picked the wrong person. I'm in tech sustainability strategy. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a techie. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to bring to this party. Um, and then I arrived in Seattle. There were six of us, never met before. And it was such a powerful experience to see how we went from having absolutely nothing and not knowing each other in the space of a few days to coming up with a, an idea that we were all passionate about, that we'd all put something into. Um, we hadn't actually built it. We had a great coach who said, you haven't got enough time to build this idea. Uh, just build the storyboard that you can then take away. Um, so I feel that pain. I'd say you can get a lot out of the experience in terms of your connections, in terms of learning things that you might not um, expect to learn. And really, I suppose, not to worry about what, what specifically you're going to bring to the table. Everyone will bring something and it will all be different. And I will take this point forward. Not to worry, just be present. And we had many of conversations like that. When people, for example, we had a data scientist, a person, mathematician, so I can feel his struggles in the team who was concerned about something without the data feed. And he said, I think I'm in the wrong place, I can't deliver anything. But his critical thinking, intelligence, understanding, comments, and help with whatever team we're doing was absolutely amazing. And this team was one of the finalists. And this colleague, he was presenting the outcome. So that is the story. So I think you have a lot of value in you. And if you will be present, you will be a great help. So please do attend. It. And what I might add is actually, I'm sort of not here today just to encourage you to attend a hackathon. But actually, you could take this back and you can run your own. I'm not an events person. I have zero skills. I could not help run this amazing conference. But I just attended this Microsoft uh, event and came back so energized by it that I was like, well, we have to do this again in our company. There's such great benefit from it. I now found myself having done three global hackathons, having met huge amounts of amazing people being invited here today. Um, so have a think about, is there a way I can take this back to, to my company and, and do something similar? So we have nine minutes left, and we've already did a part yeah. of the Q&A. So we would like, because we are a healthcare organization, right? So we need to provide a receipt, a silver bullet, how to do the hackathons, <laughs> what to take care. <laughs> You have our insights, and we can play a bingo, if you don't mind, of course. with dolls. So if you ever attend the hackathon, and many of you did, and you think this is important based on your experience, or based on your thinking without the experience, please raise your hand. So how about, which one you choose, Stephanie, for a start? Uh, how about picking the right venue? OK, how about the venue? Is it important in your opinion? Please raise your hand if it is. Not so important. I think it's a, what, what we're sort of trying to describe is that there are multiple ways of doing it. Face-to-face -face venues are really powerful and engaging. But if that's not possible, the virtual way is critical. You actually can <laughs> have uh, a great experience as well. Yeah, the virtual one is critical because if you do not have the right link, you will not be present. So that's a big simplification, but we needed to agree on communication regarding virtual venue. And how about the building the anticipation that comes before the understanding why we are doing that, how, what will be done, and uh, what will be the acceptance criteria? Who agree? 
some of you. Thank you. Which is your favourite? So building the anticipation, I think, I've learnt the hard way in that we tried to communicate to those who had... Well, we tried to communicate to get people to sign up, to take part. Then we tried to communicate more with them to build the anticipation. Uh, and what I learned is that a lot of people just don't engage until minute one on day one. Um, I can be guilty of that sometimes. So what that meant is that <laughs> on minute one, day one, a lot of people then said, oh, right, where do I have to be? And who's in my team? And yeah. what am I doing? And those teams then spent the first two hours just trying to get together and work out what they were doing. So there's a lot of value in trying to properly engage with those people who you want to take part, find a way to make sure you have engaged with them before the event, um, that you make it an exciting proposition for them so they do show up on day one. And there is another one, and I think we have time for this, and we can leave you with the others, not boring you with you know, telling about everyone. But we have a question connected with follow-up. So oh. the question was, how are we going to gather those ideas? How are we going to deliver those innovation and roadmaps tools? And I think you have the answer. Yeah, we've learned, we've learned from doing in this area as well. I think last year we had a grand idea that we'd take the winning ideas and we would build them. And actually, we came up against um, barriers around environments, around data, around resources, around budget, very quickly. Um, where the demand doesn't come in a traditional way, our organisation really struggled. So this year we've flipped it slightly and we've done, instead of saying we're going to take the winning ideas forward, what we've said is we are going to look at all your ideas and we are going to triage them, um, which we've done using colleagues from across the business, from tech, from transformation, from clinical, from strategy. So getting a real cross-section of views to triage those ideas, group them in reality, because a lot of them are against those themes that we showed earlier, or are, are very similar. And then we have suggested that there are three paths to then take those unique groups forward. One is to say, actually, this is already underway. We know there's great progress on this, and we will tell you where that progress is, and we will share that with you. And that should make you feel great, because it's like, oh, our idea is, is so valid that the business is already doing it. The second group is what we call incremental innovation. So that's where it's not so much into the future, three to five years. It's kind of the next step from where we are today. And we already have a process in Bupa um, called our Customer Experience Pipeline that's a, you know, that's a solid working process. So what we're going to do is filter those ideas in there, which basically will allow for them, again, to be prioritised and sent out to the right teams. The radical innovation, which are the ideas that are the sort of three to five years blue sky thinking, those are interesting. So our group CEO um, has seen them. He wants to follow up on a few of those. And I think there's um, work underway to basically set up an innovation hub um, that we might be able to, f where I said that we struggle if the demand doesn't come in the traditional way, what we're thinking is we can set up a hub for ideas that come in a non-traditional way where we can experiment with them and explore quickly. Um, so hopefully by next year's event, uh, that will be established. <laughs> it will be. Mm -hmm. And the last question, last question, because we run out of time. Why so big? Maybe less is more. Why so big? Why 700 people? The, f the main answer is that we wanted to be inclusive. We didn't say, mm, we think we could probably manage 200 people and that would be ideal. We took the risk of saying, we want to extend this invite to everyone in our company and make them feel if they want to take part, they can. That resulted in the 700 people. Um, had it have resulted in 4,000 people, 
we may have <laughs> we may have struggled, um, but luckily that size and scale we could support with the amount of coaches and judges um, that we knew existed in the organisation, and you know it's. Um, it brings it a certain visibility that will hopefully then encourage others to take part going forward. And I think maybe important part of that is the percentage because we are talking about an organization of around 82,000 people, right? So this 700 is just a quite a good number. All right, thank you very much. That was great talking to you about the hackathon in Bupa. Stephanie Wand. Thank you.